Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, as always, joined by Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go in to the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Two things. Please be sure to download the app, the Veritas app. Share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. And if you like what Joe and I do, very importantly, we're asking you, uh, because we know the state of social media, uh, you're censored in many, many different ways. We're asking our audience, if you're going to follow us, please do on uh, social media, primarily Rumble, the Frontline TV Newsflash, the Frontline TV Newsflash, and also Twitter, Frontline, at with Joe and Joe on Twitter. We're focusing primarily on there, building up those audiences because of the unfairness of the uh, Google-controlled YouTube. So, uh, and everybody out there knows what I'm talking about when it comes to that. You can't even probably have a conversation with a Catholic priest uh, in the future on YouTube, but hey, we don't care what they want because we have one today. We have our Father Alvaro Ramos, all right? And uh, Father is joining us to have, again, going into the breach. I want to pre- I, I put that into a little bit of a context. Today, we're going to talk about, do you want to be a saint? Well, then help the poor. It's the fast track to getting there. Now, why do we say that? Okay, because people throw that around. Help the poor, help the poor, help the poor. Jesus said you have to help the poor. He said that. See, as Catholics, we understand that we have a preferential option for the poor because after we take care of our lives, we have to give everything to him. And we're going to talk to Father about that. It's important because that gets lost in our consumerist culture. Yes, of course, we're pro-life. Yes, of course, we're pro-family. Yes, of course, we support the teaching of the church. But Father, I'm going to ask you about this in a couple minutes. I think a lot of people sitting in the pews, okay, and maybe sometimes I'm guilty of it too. Sometimes we don't want to hear about the poor. Sometimes we don't want to hear about our obligations to the poor. Well, we have one, and our blessed Lord Jesus Christ gave us one. He gave us an obligation and that's what we're going to get into. So do you want to be a saint? Let's help the poor. It's the fast track to get there. Father Alvaro Ramos is a priest of the parish of St. Teresa de Calcutta in Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras. Honduras is the second poorest country in the Americas. Father coordinates a mission for 12,000 students in the most marginal areas of Honduras that in 2019, he was awarded the King of Spain Human Rights Award. Uh, this mission has a unique feature. Older students are encouraged to uh, self-manage the organization. Um, It has supported 30 volunteer groups and parishes in Spain and Canada. Volunteers have found an opportunity to apply God's word and better understand it by serving the poor in Honduras. Father Alvaro, this is interesting. Father Alvaro is originally from Spain. He has a JD from the University uh, Pontificia de Camillas. That's the Jesuit University of Spain and an MBA from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Before becoming a priest, and this is the really interesting part, uh, Father was a corporate lawyer, investment banker, private equity executive, and social entrepreneur. He's worked for Freshfields Brockhouse Derringer, an English law firm, uh, the UNC Endowment, Bank of America Securities, and Azora, a private equity uh, manager in Spain. And Father was ordained a priest in 2018 in the capital of Honduras. Father Alvaro Ramos. Welcome to the front line with Joe and Joe. Thank you, John. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I mean, it's glad being here with you. No, thank you so much. And again, Father, like I said, and we'll get into it. Um, you know, this is a conversation I think that we need, especially American Catholics, all of us. I'm where Joe and I are not pointing the finger. We all need to be reminded there, there's there's a lot of people in this world, particularly in our country, that are in need. And we we are under obligation to do something about it. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to hand it over to Joe and we'll have a great conversation. Father, could you say a quick prayer before we uh, get into it? Excellent. Okay. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Father, stay with us in this conversation. Let us know the truth. Let us help each other, especially the poor. Let us change the world and create the kingdom of God right here on earth. Amen. Amen. Father, I'll be honest. I was looking forward. I look forward to all our conversations. I was particularly looking forward to this. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to be very honest. You are a radical man and the Catholic Church needs radical people. Why do I say that? Because you're gifted beyond comprehension. You'd be a millionaire. I work in banking. Trust me. You would be a millionaire and you know it. And you chose a different route. God calls people of all shapes and sizes he called you you listened but i'll be honest with you it's easy to ignore that call 
particularly when the world hands you a key. You had the key. You gave it back. So how did that journey begin? I think that's important. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the show, because it's true. People many times look at priests and they say, oh, he's doing this because he had no other option. No, wrong. You have a million options and you chose the better of the two. Talk about that, because I think it's important. Well, it has a lot to do because very early on in my life, I had experience with poverty. And it's actually quite a kind of a interesting story because I, I, you know, when I was 13, I'm, not, I'm, I'm originally from Madrid and I, for some reason, I wanted to play golf. And no one in my family has ever taken up the game. But I, when my parents told hey, Alvaro, Alvaro, we can buy you a set of golf clubs and you can practice on the backyard. And one year later, I said to my parents, no, but I really want to play in a, in a golf course. And well, my family is a middle class family. So they, yeah, you know, being a member in a golf club in Madrid is not cheap, but they found this golf club. It wasn't that famous, and, but it wasn't that expensive. So they, they allowed me to play over there. They paid the membership. And to my surprise, I ran into many children my age but they were actually not playing golf. They were working there. They were working as as janitors. They were working in the driving range. They were, like, you know, landscapers. They were, and and the reason they were doing that is because they they were poor. I mean, at that at that time, I'm talking about 1989, 1990. You know, in the south of Spain, there was a lot of poverty. Well, not extreme poverty, but it was still poverty. You know, to the extent that many children they needed to drop out of school and go and, and find a job and make money for the families. Actually, it was completely the opposite of my situation. And to me, that was really shocking. I mean, you know, I was a fortunate guy that could actually go um, to school, but also to play golf. Whereas I met children my age, they were actually, you know, they needed to make money for the families. And, and I spent many years, I mean, like with them. Because I were I was on my own in the golf course. I love playing golf, but you know, since I was on my own, because my parents actually they couldn't actually pay for a membership, it was only me. My friends they become all these, these children, and uh, and that allowed not only to get to know them, but I get to know their families and get to know some neighborhoods of Madrid in the south that normally you don't know. I mean, if I'm from the north, it's like if you are you're from Manhattan, you never go to the Bronx. I mean, you may go, yes, but I mean, you don't live in the Bronx, or you don't yeah, go. Just passing, just passing through on the Gross Bronx Expressway, Father. That's about as. <laughs> that's 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 like that's, the, that's your experience in the Bronx. Just you know, going through the highway, and so to me, that was a you know, I was really fortunate because that allowed me to get to know poverty and how unfair was life. And on the other hand, that you know. I used to play in the mornings with lawyers, entrepreneurs, you know, bankers, you know, because, you know, I ended up playing, you know, I ended up being a good golfer. In the afternoons, I used to hang out with my friends. They used to play at nights. They, now they're all golf professionals, but they learn, they, they learn the game playing during night, actually, with my golf clubs, night meaning in the afternoon. So, and, but so I learned, you know, the how unfair is the world, but also, you know, the, the corporate lawyers, the the bankers, entrepreneurs. I mean, they were they were successful because they had the opportunity to study, and they and over the years, I understand that you know that my my friends, you know, all these poor children, they were not actually you know the only option in the life was to become or, or stay working in the golf course or to become a golf professional. So that opportunity also taught me that you need to take advantage advantage of the opportunities. And, the, and, and also the importance of education. So it kind of created a mindset where I learned that way I need to take advantage of my own. I need to get the best of these opportunities, but at some point I need to give back. And that's kind of the foundation of, of my life. So after that, you know, I went to law school and I got a very good job in a, in a law firm. And then I went to North Carolina to did an MBA and so on and so forth. But I knew that I, I needed to give back because it was sort of my obligation because everything that I that I had, it wasn't only for me. You know, I got lucky in my life. And also actually, 
by hanging out with, you know, these corporate lawyers and bankers in a golf course, I also learned that when you have a lot of money, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are happy, you know, because I knew them, you know, I was, you know, I was in my, in, when I was a teenager, even in my early twenties, most of my friends, they were also bankers and lawyers. They were like 20, 25, 30 years older than me. And I can notice that they were not actually happy. Not, I mean, they had like, you know, obviously very easy lives, but I mean, I didn't want to spend my life just playing golf uh, with expensive watch and with a nice car. I mean, their their life wasn't actually that that attractive to me. I didn't see a lot of purpose in their life uh, because they, they actually they were accumulating wealth, but I didn't see a real purpose out of it. Out of it, so that's kind of the the, the one of the reasons one of the reasons why I at some point in my life I said well I need to give back, and at first I tried to to do it through business. One of the reasons I went to North Carolina is because North Carolina was a pioneer on what they call at the time the base of the pyramid. Base of the pyramid are some economic theories explaining why, you know, poor people can be customers. I mean, that you can offer them good, you know, services and products at very low prices. It's low margin, but it's a huge market. It's a lot of volume and you can make money. And at the same time, you can, you know, help them by because they are underserved markets. But I, I tried that. Then I tried affordable housing. Then I um and try impact investing. But at the end, of, and you know that happened over a long period of time, until I got to know actually extreme poverty in in Latin America, especially in Honduras. And I realized that all these business ideas they didn't actually work for ex for, for for poverty for extreme poverty. And that's where I got to know the Catholic Church the missions of the Catholic Church. And then I kind of, you know, I made a decision that I needed to actually to, Jesus is the one who's got the key, the best model to turn around poverty and to create uh, the perfect work for all of us is through the Catholic Church and through Jesus and being a missionary. Absolutely. Father Alvaro Ramos joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Do you want to be a saint? Serve the poor. That's what Christ said. Joe Rosanello. Father, I want to talk about something you said, because I had a similar uh, experience. I I got married later in life. I've traveled a lot. I've traveled through the third world. I have seen poverty um, in Haiti, Cambodia, Vietnam, India specifically, uh, South Africa, too. It, it's not as extreme as those. The Bronx, places. the Bronx. Um, and it had a deep impact on me as well. But I want to just relate a personal story with what you said. When you see poverty like that, I can remember I was backpacking in Vietnam. I come from very normal people. My father was a barber, one person barber shop. My grandfather came from Italy, worked in a factory. Um, I was in Vietnam backpacking and people in Vietnam and in India, they cut hair on the street, on a crate, on a corner. And I went to a Jesuit school. I went to a Jesuit graduate school as well. And I said to myself, here's this man. He may have a son. My father is a barber, and here I am. I have this education. I'm traveling all over the world. This man is absolutely poor. God is going to say to you, what did you do, Joe? What did you do? I have given you this. You're no different than the son of that man, but you're just born somewhere else. God loves him just as much as he loves my father, and he loves me. What are you going to do? And that had a very deep impact on me. Um, and I, to this day, I mean, I, I, I mean, my wife and I, we both work. We have five children. My wife is Haitian. Um, you know, we try. Obviously, we have to take care of our kids. But to this day, I actually went and we do pretty well. My wife went went has an MBA too. Um, I actually feel guilty when we make money. Like, like, like I, like I have, like, I don't want to be rich. I'll be completely truthful with you. I just want to take care of my kids' needs. I want to educate them. I live in a very modest house. I live in a, I drive a 20 year old car. I have to take, but that impact of seeing the poor and what you're doing with these volunteers is you're exposing them to Jesus. When you help the poor, you're helping Jesus. It's an encounter with Jesus without even saying his name. And, and that's my experience, but that's what you're doing with those volunteers. They will never be the same. 
talk about that because I'm telling you, I guarantee you when they leave those volunteers, talk about your organization. They're never going to be the same, no matter whether they go to Yale or they frankly become a mechanic. Well, actually, our our, our mission, I mean, I founded a, a foundation with a friend of mine when I was working in private equity because I, 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 I wanted to give back and I wanted to do it on my own because I didn't want to actually give money to a very large NGO. Because I know that, you know, NGOs, you have a lot of overhead and intermediaries. And so I wanted to actually to find grassroots NGOs in Latin America. So, but again, I didn't want actually, when, when I found a small NGOs in Latin America, I didn't like them, not because it was, they were very small and then didn't actually close the gap. Meaning that, I mean, for example, we used to help a kindergarten in Bogota, in the outer scale of Bogota, the capital of, of Colombia. But I was thinking, you know, what's going to happen with these children? So, you know, later on, I mean, so I, I was looking for, a, you know, an organization that, you know, was more integrated. So I so I went to Honduras because someone told me about this mission that Father Patricio, uh, another missionary from Spain, founded many years ago. Uh, this is actually the mission where I've been right under now the last 12 years. Um, Father Patricio started this mission 30 years ago with two basic rules. The first rule is that I'm going to help children and the two conditions. Uh, the first condition is that he, I'm going to help you as long as you help others. And the second one is that you got to help, but in a um, you got to do good, good, meaning that I'm, I expect you every single day in the parish at 7 a.m. From 7 a.m. to noon, you need to be here and help others, expect other people because you are poor. But I can try, I can tell you that people are equally poor as you, or maybe maybe poorer than you. And after after lunch, and I'm happy to provide you for lunch, then you're gonna go to high school or university. So that's the the kind of the foundation of our mission is that we help poor people, children and teenagers and young adults, as long as they help others. And that strategy is actually on, on purpose to help them. Because as, as you rightly mentioned, I mean, by teaching them to help others and using the gospel as a, you know, as the engine to the engine to find the motivation and the strength to help others, you are actually helping them more than the degree itself. It's so the way it works in our mission is that every morning we have a lot of teenagers and young adults. I mean, the 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 I mean, obviously, for we help 12,000 students, as you mentioned. Most of them are children in between zero to 14 years old, but there are 500 of them that they are above 14 years old. So these are the ones that are required to come to the to our church, uh, to the parish every single day to help in the mornings and in the afternoons after lunch they go to high school or they go to college, but. You know, if, if we only teach, help them to go to become professionals, lawyers, engineers, and so on and so forth, that's actually that not useful for them, not even for society. Because in Honduras, there are many lawyers and, and businessmen, but they are selfish. And actually, they are not helping the society. They are not even helping themselves. Because as I mentioned before, you know, if you make a lot of money, that's not necessarily good to you. Because I know a lot of people with a lot of money that they don't have a true, you know, they are not happy. Their life it has no purpose at all. But if you if you teach people to help others and to get to know Jesus and to find out that Jesus wants loves you and not only you love you, Jesus wants you to become a main character in changing the world. And on top of that, you have the opportunity to become a professional. That's really really powerful. I mean, good people with good skills. That's really strong. So, but it's the combination of both things. It's not only the professional skills, it's also the ability and the understanding and the, you know, like the, of, of, of the need to help others. It's because not only because it's the fair thing to do because we need to create an equal society, it's because by doing that, your life, as, and you're gonna find true, a true purpose in your life. Father Alvaro Ramos is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. We're discussing, uh, do you wanna be a saint? Well, help the poor. That's the fast track of getting there. And that's what that's what Father Ramos is doing through his organization. Father, let me ask you this. 
uh, just to d- d- go with not in a different direction, but maybe on a different level. You know, we hear about the poor all the time. The political left, obviously, you know, they talk about the poor. It becomes an abstraction, Father. So you, 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 you don't even know what they mean. How important is it? Joe mentioned his work. All right, Joe's been doing that a long time before I met him. Our wives are sisters. I met Joe in 2013. He's my brother-in-law. Joe, I, I was amazed, you know, talking about backpacking in Cambodia. I'm not going backpacking in Cambodia. But I will tell you this. Um, because of being introduced uh, into that, I started to do similar. Similarly, Joe and I have friends with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. And I never actually fed a poor person. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because heaven knows that I'm not a saint. All right. Um, And I thought and I used to say to my wife when she first introduced me to volunteering with the Franciscan sisters. Right. I thought and I said to my wife, do you realize that supposedly we're serving them, but they're actually serving us? Because even though I might be putting a dish of food in in front of somebody who's overjoyed that somebody would actually feed them. All right. That when you see and it's true, you see that you see Christ's face in their face. All right. And you are a new person or you're becoming a new person through your service to the poor. It's not an abstraction. You're seeing somebody, Father, you know, when we get mad about our finances, we 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 punch the wall. These are people who have nothing and, and many times have other issues like addiction and things like that. All right. And you're feeding them. Talk about how we are served by Christ. By serving his poor. That's where I was going with that. Well, actually, there are many reasons. The first one is that, I, I mean, one of the the things that to me make the Catholic Church the, the only one is the fact that, you know, uh, the Catholic Church is the root of some of the best accomplishments in humankind and mankind. Education. And health. And you know, by helping the poor, not you know, we are creating an equal society. I mean, all these children that we help here in Honduras eventually are gonna become nurses. I mean, lawyers, engineers, mechanics. The problem in in, in poor countries is that they don't have the society. People people actually mention them as a fail fail government, fail states. I don't agree with that. They're not even failed. They're they're, they're non-existent. That's the reason in Mexico and, and in Colombia and even here, gangs and cartels and guerrilla are very strong. And they're very strong is because the state and the civil society is not strong enough, is not broad enough to cover everyone. So uh, by helping the poor, what we're doing is creating a society that is well structured and that's going to help all of us. So normally, for example, here in, in, in Tegucigalpa, the capital of Honduras, when I go, I live in a poor neighborhood. But when I go to another neighborhood, but like the middle or upper middle class, I talk to them and say, you know what? I mean, many people here, they have health insurances here in Tegucigalpa. The only, the only city in, in Honduras, other than another one, is called San Pedro Sula, where you find a good hospital is here. And some of them, they even have, you know, health insurance in, in America. So if they want to wanna get medical treatment, they, they need to fly to Houston. And but my point is, well, you have health insurance here in Tegucigalpa, but you you can you can travel to rural areas. If you try to rural area and you have an accident, even though you have health insurance, even though you may have a million dollars in your backpack, no one is gonna treat you because you're not gonna find a nurse or a physician. And even if you find a clinic, the clinic is not gonna have the medicines to do now or the equipment to do the surgery. So by you really need to help the poor because by helping the poor, you're helping yourself. You wanna, because, you know, America is a very good example. I mean, uh, at, you know, 200 years ago, America was like very poor, was, wasn't actually even a country, right? So after a lot of years helping each other, you create a country where, you know, you can travel everywhere and you have, you know, like some minimum standards as the same in, in Europe. And the reason in Europe everyone is educated and everyone has health is because of the Catholic Church. It's because that idea of helping the poor so that no one is poor. Everyone ha- plays a role in society because we need everyone to create an equal society. So that's, that's one, in my, my opinion, a very strong argument, idea. And another idea is, again, it's coming back to my earlier points, is that, you know, helping the poor is good for yourself. 
I mean, at some point in your life, you're going to ask yourself, well, what am I going to do with my life? I mean, what's the point of accumulating wealth? What's the point? I mean, what's the what's the impact I'm creating in, in, in life? I mean, obviously, it's your family. But beyond your family, people need to feed. I mean, in my opinion, the only way you're going to be happy is not only, I mean, obviously, it all starts with your family. But, but it has a lot to do with the impact on society. So you're not going to be happy if you go to the garage and you have a lot of Ferraris and Rolls Royce and very expensive cars. I mean, that doesn't give you happiness. But real happiness, when you're about to die, actually, that's, I, I normally ask all people, I mean, tell me, what's the thing that you are most proud of? No one mentioned how big is their house. No one mentioned how nice, you know, the cars. They mention anecdotes when they help people. So, let me hear a song, yeah. you know, I, yeah. <clears throat> You know, Father Alvaro Ramos joining us here at the front line with JoJo. Father, listen, I'm not being, I don't want to sound judgmental. I know sometimes I can, but I live in Scottsdale, Arizona now, okay? And uh, I'm here for about a year and a half, but I'm from New Jersey. I'm not far from where Joe lives are from Newark, New Jersey. Um, if you want, you just described Scottsdale. And I say to myself, and I try to make money. Don't get me wrong, Father. I go out and go to work and play the market a little bit. All right. I want to make money to, to, for my family. But I really look at people sometimes. And it's unfortunate. Because then when you, after the break, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, because I'd like you to talk about maybe when we come back, uh, if we get to it, uh, who really is poor. Because sometimes I see people who are uber, uber wealthy. Lots and lots of money. $100,000 Rolex, Okay. Uh, driving up into the place I work, driving a, a some sort of quarter of a million dollar car or more. In fact, that's one of the cheap ones. But I see what you were talking about in them. It's very routine. It's nice restaurant. I golf during the day. My wife goes to the salon, blah, blah, blah. And that's life. Big fat bank account, father. But to them, that's life. I'm wondering, like you mentioned, on their deathbed, is their thought going to be their eternal soul? Or that they're not going to be able to drive their Ferrari anymore. Quick comment on that, Father. Well, you're totally right. I mean, there's no. I mean, one one example. I think the most the the medicine that is most consumed in in Europe and probably in America is anxiolytics. So it it's it doesn't correlate. I mean, it's the country with the largest GDP. I mean, America and Europe, and people and the most consumed medicine, even above cancer. It's anxiolytics. People are not happy. So they, they need to buy medicine. So, so there's something wrong. There's something funny in that society that doesn't work. No, well, that's when, like you said, when you when you listen to the Catholic Church, when you follow her teachings, when you follow the teachings of our Lord, you know, Lord, the Lord said, I came to give you life and, and life to its fullest. OK, well, again, like I said, nobody begrudges having a few bucks. All right. But you're not really living your life if that's your focus. Father, we have to take a quick break here at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. If you're just joining us, Father Alvaro Ramos, uh, uh, you know, we're so pleased and honored that he would join us today for this conversation to talk about our obligation to the poor and, of course, what he's doing about it in Honduras. So stick around. We're going to be back in a minute. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo, Joe Resinello. We are way in the breach with Father Alvaro Ramos, and we are having a great conversation about the poor. You want to be a saint? Help the poor. That's the fast track to get there. Joe Resinello. Father, in my experience <clears throat> with the poor, I'm going to focus on India. I worked with handicapped kids, um, kids the missionaries of charity took care of, and I worked with them for a number of years. Um, and the people in the first world, people from Spain, Europe, Australia, Canada, America would go there, volunteer. And you could look at some of these kids, and many people do in the first world, and say, I feel sorry for this child. Or this child, you know, almost like from a superiority perspective. As the years went on, in my experience working with them, I actually came to this conclusion. They're better off than me. And I'm going to expand on it. One, they're simple. And Christ said, unless you become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Their life is just, everything is provided for them by the sisters. They're loved infinitely by them. So many people in the first world, rich, poor, or indifferent, don't know what love is, never experience it. They're infinitely loved. And they die 
in the grace of the sacraments because the teachers form the uh, the sisters form them. They're better off than me. I've come to that conclusion. I swear. And I talk about that because I think the first world looks at the third world many times, especially people who've experienced success. And they look almost even when they're helping. I, like I'm in a position of superiority. I'm helping this person. No, because Jesus also said something, which I'm always very mindful of. The last will be first and the first will be last. Mother Teresa would say that person is going to, to defend me at the gate of heaven. When God is saying, should I let Joe Restinello in? Maybe that kid will say, he's okay. Let him in. You know, like, Talk about that because I think the perspective is skewed. I actually think in many respects, these people have a clearer vision of God, which is reality. And frankly, our vision is, is blurred. Well, I'm going to share with you one, you know, one of my, one of the things I normally tell to, to myself and to even my parents. And I don't have kids myself. I mean, obviously I have only children that are my kids, but the closer thing that I have, you know, um, it's my knee and my nephew. And I have a knee and a nephew. They are 14 and 16 years old. They are bilingual. They, you know, they are really smart. They go to this American school in Barcelona in Spain. And they go, they are, you know, they're only 20 in each class. They, they already know how to program in a computer. But then I look to, at my other kids here. Well, they don't even, they speak Spanish, but they make a lot of mistakes grammatically. They don't speak English. Uh, they, you know, they know how to use a computer, but I mean, with very basic, you know, techniques. And, but they actually, they know how to help each other and others. And when I look, not only I'm nephew, my knee, I mean, that my brother and my, my sister-in-law are doing a good job, but still, if you live in Barcelona or you live in, in wherever, in Scotland or New York or in Paris, I mean, it's very difficult not to have selfish children because they have everything. And they don't relate to poverty. They don't relate to be generous to others. And, I, and as you said, Joe, I mean, they don't have simple life. It has too, complicated, too complex life. It's you go to school, then you need to learn another language, then you need to play the piano, then you need to play the violin and so on and so forth. And they're very talented in some areas, but they're not very talented in helping each other, in generosity, in, in human values. And that's kind of a, kind of being poor. So I would love that my knee and my nephew spend at least one year with my other children. We, one one of the best projects that we have are, are actually dormitories for students in very remote rural areas. And they come here to Tegucigalpa and they spend like almost 10 years like finishing uh, the normal school, high school and college. And they live in bank beds and they do everything together. I mean, they because we don't have enough money to have like a, someone taking care of the dormitories themselves. The older ones take care of the younger ones. So they're organized so that they cook for everyone. They clean for everyone. They they also, they are in charge of many other projects. They're in charge of our administration. They're in charge of logistics. So their hours are very long. I mean, the lives are very simple, but I mean, they are really, I mean, the their human values are so strong that I'm so envious of them compared to my my nephew and my knee and my and the um and the children of my friends so normally I told my friends you know what you know I, I here's a, a huge opportunity for your children but what's the point of having a children that is bilingual and has a lot of things but they don't have real human values so bring it over to the Guthigalpa and make them to spend quality time here because what we are offering here with the Catholic Church at a mission that the poor are offering to us in the third world is much more important than being bilingual and ha having to use a computer. Funny thing, that is very difficult to convince people in Spain or America to send their children for a long period of time. They don't want to do that. And that's, that's kind of a poverty, to my, my opinion. So I agree with you, Joe. 
Well, Father Alvaro Ramos, talk about uh, you know, while we're going there. It sounds to me like we're we, we're in need of a a nice, healthy dose of humility. Um, talk about the need for. And listen, if you're going to feed the poor, you're gonna you're gonna have to humble yourself. If you're if you if you're going to um, empathize with someone who does not have anything, many times you're going to have to humble yourself. Jesus was humble. You got to be humble. Talk about the need for that fundamental uh, virtue of humility. You got to come down from your perch. Well, I mean, I think we, we have a lot of volunteers, international volunteers. They come here for 15, 15 days or a month or two months. When you get to know extreme poverty, then you, you realize that, wow, I mean, it's really different from my hometown. I, I remember once we got this lady from Spain and we, he was complaining about the food. The food in the, in the dormitories and in the in a we normally feed six thousand children, but the food actually is very low quality. I mean, it's beans, rice, some vegetables. The, this woman was complaining, and I told her, "Well, do you you know do you have any? No, it's it's very common in in missions to have scholarships, like like uh, someone pay you a fee, like every month to sponsor a child, and." I, so I so I asked this woman, do you, do you sponsor a child? Yes. How much do you pay? Fifteen bucks. Okay. Do you have children? Yes. How? What is the average expensive in for your children every month? Around six hundred euros. I mean, if you give me fifteen bucks per month, but you're giving six hundred euros for your child in in Spain. I mean, I'm providing what you are giving to me. So if the food is low quality, it's not my fault. It's actually your fault. So because if you are treating, if you sponsor a child, it's more or less, I mean, it's not actually that way, but it's, it's like, and I, I don't know, like 3% for your child in Honduras. So. You gotta be humble and say, you know what, you know, maybe, you know, I need to spend less amount of money in my children in Spain and transfer that wealth into the other ones. Um, but in order to do that, you gotta be really humble and really generous and, and make make huge sacrifices. And and again, I'm not saying that. I think my point is not, you know. If, if you need $500 to take of your children in, in New York, that's okay. But you, instead of buying an expensive car or instead of buying an expensive house or instead of having an expensive holiday, you need to refrain from that. Take that money and instead of sponsor a child for 15 bucks, sponsor a child for 200 bucks and, you know, refrain from, you know, playing golf or, or whatever, mm -hmm. or, or buying an expensive watch or whatever you, you know, the other uses that you have for your money. Use your money better and wisely for the poor. And yeah. the, only, the only way to do that is through humility. Yeah, Father Alvaro Ramos joining us at the front line with Joe and Joe. Father, I'm going to hand it over to Joe. In my experience, I'll tell you this, a lot of times, even amongst Catholics, unfortunately, um, the uh, people, Catholics, feel uncomfortable when they're constantly told about the church's teaching on uh, abortion, on family, on sexuality, and things like that. In my experience, when the priest talks about feeding the poor, those same people are just as uncomfortable. Um, it kind of almost like, you know, they don't want to hear, just like they don't want to hear about the moral issues in regards to sexuality. Oh, I don't need to be reminded about the poor all the time. It's, it's something like that. And and again, I, I don't want to sound judgmental, but you know, as I try to take in all of the church teaching and listen to everything, okay, and we all try to do what I can, but it, but I, I find this discomfort, and it's like, why are you why are you uncomfortable? Then listen, if you're going to feel uncomfortable, you might you might feel as uncomfortable as the rich man who Jesus said, yeah, you do everything right, now go and sell everything, give it away, and come and follow me, because ultimately, if you have ten million dollars in the bank, the Lord doesn't begrudge you for it, but if He asks you to give it up for Him. You got to be willing to do it. That's my two cents. Joe Restinello. Father, the church is not an NGO. Joe. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, the yeah. church mm -hmm. is not an NGO. I mean, ultimately, there are groups that just work to, for the poor, you know, out there. 
but the church helps the poor. As my mother would say, um, ultimately, if the Catholic Church shut its doors, you would hear the cries across the ocean. I've seen this with my own eyes. No one, nothing on the earth no organization feeds more people, clothes more people, educates more people. That's undeniable. Anyone who doesn't accept that reality isn't in reality because it's the truth. With that said, though, we're here to save souls. And many of these children, and this is, again, my own witness of seeing it, are better formed than people in Europe and America. They're children. They're better formed in their faith. They're taught and they actually receive the teaching. It's not the secondary like thing in many American universities or, or very good high schools. Oh, I learned a little bit about theology, but I want to go to Harvard. I want to go to Yale. That's not so important. And I'll just relay a story about that. I could remember being in a mass in Haiti. Maybe there was 500 kids and the mass started. And they started singing. And there was a big statue of the sacred heart of Jesus. I swear, I was just like, it was like outer body. Like, I was like, these children are close to God. Like, I, I almost felt like I should leave. Like, I don't belong there. Because, like, it was, I can't even explain what, like, welled up. Like, to hear the voices of children. Formed children. Their goal is heaven. Is that our goal? I don't think it is. And they're formed. We're not here just to feed them. We're here to form them. Talk about the difference, because that's what the church does. Well, that's actually a very good point. And it's not, I mean, th that's the reason Father Patricio, he was so right when he said, hey, this is not about you receiving food or, or not even formal education. It's about you discovering the gospel and discovering the true meaning of life that is giving your life to others. So, so it's not, I mean, giving food is very important, giving education and providing for things, but it's, you, you got to do it like hand in hand with teaching them about the gospel and not only teaching them about the gospel, it's applying the gospel. So, and that's actually the beauty of the Catholic Church. It's not all talking about the gospel, it's living by the gospel. And that's, a, for and, and as I said, it goes hand, hand to hand because it's not, I mean, for example, in here, Every Thursday, we stop everything, all our activities, and we do what is called Lecto Divina. That means, you know, reading the gospel of the next Sunday and discussing it and applying it to our daily lives. That's really important, but which, in my opinion, is even more important is that with these other students, especially the older ones, that they take care of the administration and the logistics and everything, is that how do you administer money? How do you take care of logistics? with the gospel, because when you, de you deal with money and when you deal with uh, logistic problems or with, in education, taking care of, we have a lot of kindergartens and the students are in, in church of taking care of the network of, of a network of 26 kindergartens, they're gonna come up a lot of problems and they need to come up with solutions. But they come up with the solution using the gospel. Okay, why would Jesus, how would be Jesus' solution on this specific matter? How would it, how would Jesus deal with this issue? So, and I think that's the beauty of the Catholic, not only explaining the gospel, is is by is teaching people and encouraging people to live their lives with the gospel in every single aspect in your life. It's not only in, only in God, you know. Obviously, you need to go to mass. Obviously, you need like to divina. But actually, when the mass stops. Is the beginning of your of your life. It's actually with when you lead the mass with with God in your heart and in your soul, so that you're gonna change the world. You know, not so the church is not the the mass is the beginning, if not the end, it's the beginning of a new life. So, you know, that's a really good point. I mean, it's we don't wanna that we don't wanna help people to become professionals. As I mentioned before, there are many good professionals in Latin America. But the point is that they are not generous enough. They don't have God in their souls. And even some of, these pro some of these professionals, they know about the gospel, but they don't apply it in their daily lives. So you need people who are very smart, but also they know how to apply the gospel and they have the commitment to apply the gospel every single day. And, and as, as Joe mentioned before, it's 
you the problem is not about making money. I mean, it's good making money. I mean, you, we need people creating wealth. I mean, this is not about, you know, I, I don't have anything against millionaires and billionaires. I'm actually very smart people. We need them. I mean, they pay taxes. They allocate capital. They are very efficient. The problem is, what are you going to do with that wealth? That's the point. If you are taught by the gospel and you know how to apply the gospel in your daily life, you're going to know how to allocate that wealth to the to the needs of, of people in society. Absolutely. And in fact, if, if if you look at what some of the enemies of Christ and what some of the enemies of the church, uh, you, how they use their wealth, okay, um, then, uh, you know, our rich, particularly Catholics, and there are uber duper wealthy Catholics out there, okay, uh, can do the same thing. All right. Put it at the service of Christ. So, uh, Father, let me ask you this. It's always a hot button issue. It's always one of those things where, you know, Joe and I, we agree with you, obviously, a thousand percent on the Catholic Church. If you want the right perspective on a particular issue, listen to the Catholic Church. Let's talk about immigration. Joe, we're Americans. Joe and I are Americans. Right. We believe in a strong border. But let's fa let's face it. If some first of all, we think that the poor and the immigrants, they're being used by the political left. I don't think that that's any question about that. That's a topic for another day. But nonetheless, there are some on the right that if they wanted what they want when it comes to immigration, well, then Joe's Joe's grandparents couldn't have come here. My mother couldn't have come here if some of those things were 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 implemented when it comes to immigration policy. All right. Um, not that we don't agree with rules, but give our audience here at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network the proper Catholic perspective on balancing the the rights of a sovereign nation to its border and the need to welcome the stranger. Uh, yeah, I think the the best solution is to create opportunities, in this case, in Honduras. I mean, I think in America is great because you guys take care of migrants very well in America. I mean, I know many, you know, when I travel to the States, I traveled the other day to Washington, D.C., and I met a lot of people from Central America. All, all the kids and children are bilingual. The, all of them they have scholarships and they actually they can even go to college straight because they have they're in schools where they help them to study to high school and then they have the opportunity to apply for scholarships for college and that's great but i think the problem the root of the problem is not in america the root of the problem is in honduras when i talk to foundations in america i don't know like probably 90 percent of them they only help america they don't, you know, it's all the programs, all the scholarships, all the grants are for America, not for Honduras or whatever, or Mexico, Guatemala. So I think, but the root of the problem is the lack of opportunities here. So if you provide them opportunities also here, uh, you know, people are not going to actually, they're not going to like, no, I think no one that really want to leave their country. Well, some may have, but most of them, they, you're going to stay with your country, with your people, with your families. So I think, I mean, and I agree that United States, Europe, they cannot actually welcome everyone because, I mean, there is some limit, there are some limitations. I mean, and, and, and so this will be a balance between, okay, how many migrants we can accept? And we're going to make sure that the migrants that come here, they have good opportunities, but also we're going to, help those countries to create opportunities for, for their own people. And I think, you know, the right balance is to, I think the problem is, you know, where you have so many institutions and foundations helping only in America and only in Europe and just a few elsewhere. And I think Catholic means universal. I mean, borders are actually created by human, not by God. So I think you know, with a Catholic mindset, we should say, you know what, you know, I'm gonna, my foundation is going to focus in America, but it's going to focus also in Mexico and Guatemala. I don't know, 50-50, maybe actually more, because actually, you know, there, there are more people in need outside of America than in America. But most of the philanthropy, and I think America is the number one country in philanthropy, but it's the number one country in philanthropy in America, not elsewhere. Right. Right. So I think it's Father, my point is from a Catholic point of view is a shift towards, you know, overseas. And 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 I know that in America you have USA, the government, but actually, I mean, when USA does a good job, but I think the 
Catholic foundation, they do a, a missionaries, they do a much better job and helping overseas. I, I don't I think I think if you if you look at the the history of the Catholic Church, I think that's an undeniable fact. Um, you 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 mentioned earlier Father Alvaro Ramos joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. You know those things that Western civilization and Western cultures take for granted. Um, and and believe me, I get into these arguments all the time. I say, you know, where did that come from? Where did the hospital come from? That didn't exist before the Catholic Church. Pagan Rome didn't have hospitals. Greece didn't have hospitals. Catholic Church founded hospitals. Universities, okay. Our, our, the whole university system is founded by the Catholic Church. The scientific method was invented by the Catholic Church. What are you talking about? In other words, the church has been on the cutting edge of all of this from the beginning and under severe persecution, okay, was able to thrive and get to that point and contributed so much. Nobody knows it better than us. Nobody knows it better than the Catholic Church about how to do what it is that you're doing. But it requires, as we said, and that's the topic of this conversation, start with the basics. You know, if you, you want to rebuild or help to build a society, start with the basics. Concern yourself. Don't look at the poor as abstractions. Look at them as human beings made in the image and likeness of God. We have a few minutes left. Father, Al, uh, Father Alvaro, I'm going to hand it over to Joe. Mission goes beyond the third world, Father. I want to end with this. I mean, clearly you're a person for others and you're on the front line. Let's be honest. Um, and I have done work similar to yours, obviously, as a layman, but it's not for everybody. Why do I say that? Not everyone's going to go to the third world country. Not everyone has the means and or the desire. But that doesn't mean you're not a missionary. You see, Christ, if you're baptized, you're on a mission. God, I had a priest, and I'm going to end it with this and then please comment. He used to say, when we stand before the Lord, he's going to say, who did you bring with you? Obviously, if your father, you bring your children, and your wife, because that's your job to get them to heaven. Um, you as a priest, you bring your congregation. But he's going to ask everybody that. Who did you bring with you? I gave you a treasure. How did you invest that treasure? We're all missionaries. Talk about that, because I think that gets lost. Well, that's actually, that's something that I normally say to people is that we are all missionaries. I mean, our, our work here in the mission, you know, the miracle, what we do here is a, is a miracle. I mean, imagine I'm feeding 6,000 children every day, like uh, teaching 12,000 students every day. This is not that only here in Honduras. This thanks to people in Spain, Canada, and in America, people that go to know us and say, you know what? I'm going to become a missionary. I cannot try, as you rightly say. You, I cannot travel to Honduras. I've got my own job, but I'm happy to, you know, to sponsor kids. The In Spain and actually in, in Canada, unfortunately right now, there are some people in America that they are every, every month, they are thinking of ways to help us. So we have like volunteers groups, like missionaries. We can call it missionaries groups in Madrid, in Barcelona, some people in New York, some people in, in Canada, in Toronto. They are thinking, hey, you know, I'm going to, provide, you know, it's raising money, sending goods. We get like almost 40 containers every year. And that's, that's you know, it's people that say, you know what? It's, I want to help. I cannot travel, but I've, I've got a skills and I have wealth. And I got to call others. I think this is a great, and, and people do that not only because they feel obliged. It, it's a great opportunity for them. I mean, that's something that they, they, they needed. Some people, hey, you know, and they're actually, they were, they felt, very fortunate to get to know us because there was something that was missing in their lives. Is that idea, okay, I'm going to use my wealth, my resources, my time to do something really meaningful. I mean, I take care of my family. I take care of my job, my company. That's important. But we always have a gap. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, we, true happiness about, you know, impacting positively in our societies. So, and that has a lot to do with the idea of being a missionary. We all have a mission. And and, and I, our missions are very different, but we are missionary in, in the ways we can do it. But they are very similar because it's creating the kingdom of God by creating a society that is good for all of us. So you you know we I can help here because many people in America and Spain they help us. You know I can be a missionary because you guys are missionaries as well. What you're doing right now is really helping me. I'm a missionary because so and so. 
<laughs> Father Alvaro Ramos. Uh, so one more time for our audience here at the Veritas Network. So the the name of the just specifically the name of the organization, um, website where our audience members maybe could go help you out, contribute, donate, give of their treasure. I give you the floor for for the next minute, Father. Okay, well, you can send me the... Well, the name is not very good. I mean, we need to work on the name, but it's called ACOES, A-C-O-E-S. It stands for Association, Collaboration, and Effort. And if someone is interested, they can drop me an email. It's my name, Alvaro, A-L-V-A-R-O-R-A-M-O-S at A-C-O-E-S dot O-R-G. Maybe, Joe, you can write it down somewhere in the links. It's we 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 have it we have it and and could uh, could our audience members um can they contribute on there on the website uh well actually it's better we we are working on that because we they can contribute on the website if they are from spain and probably none of them are listening to us we are working on that in in america maybe it's better if they drop me an email and also i mean we we need help but we offer we also offer help meaning that we welcome everyone we don't charge every, that's something unique from the Catholic Church as well. If you wanna visit many missions, you need to pay. And in our case, it's for free. Just buy a flight ticket. We're gonna pick you up in the airport. You can stay in our dormitories. It, it really doesn't matter. We, you, you don't need experience. We don't have any age limitations. We have volunteers that they are 80 something years old. So okay. not only asking for help, but also we are offering help. All right, and Father, what we'll do is we'll make sure when it airs, um, on social media and wherever it goes, uh, we'll make sure we put your contact information uh, so that anybody listening, uh, hopefully they'll feel inspired by the Holy Spirit and they'll they'll get involved and they'll contribute. Father Alvaro Ramos, God bless you. Uh, you are now officially, I hope you don't mind, a, a, a brother, a friend of the front line with Joe and Joe. So you're stuck. You're part of the family now. Um, and you are welcome back here anytime. We love this conversation. It was great. God bless you. God bless you, too, and congratulations for your program. Thank you, Father, and thank you all out there for joining us at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith in the New York City metropolitan area. Thanks once again, and remember, until the next time, that our conversation is your conversation, and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>